Once we deconstruct value, we deconstruct the pursuit of knowledge. We deconstruct facts. We deconstruct the nobility of science and science becomes hijacked and the information ecology breaks down. So we're precisely at a moment when the information ecology is broken down. And, and look at the huge conflict over vaccines in which there's two very clear sides that actually don't speak to each other when there's validated information on both sides, but actually it's not being driven by fact. It's being driven by other meta narratives, right? Which actually collapse the system. Friends, where are we in this moment? We're poised between utopia and dystopia. And that sentence is unbelievably important. We're not on the brink of dystopia. We're poised between utopia and dystopia. There's an unimaginably beautiful future that awaits us. We can create the most good, true, and beautiful world that we know is possible. And we have the resources to do it, if only, if only, and there's a, there's a huge if only there, and we're going to talk about that if only today. And at the same time, without the if only, we actually are poised at the brink of dystopia, and not per se, as the Don't Look Up movie has been interpreted because of climate change. Climate change is an unbelievably important issue, self-evidently and obviously. It's a far more complex issue than the way it's presented. I'd recommend uh, two colleagues of mine, Michael Zimmerman, a professor in Denver, and Sean Hargens, wrote an excellent book called Integral Ecology, where you'll get a deep sense of what actually the ecology issue is and, and what climate change is. But suffice it to say that it's not the most serious of the existential risks. And when we say we're poised between utopia and dystopia, what we mean is that all civilizations, as Tainter, Joseph Tainter points out, all civilizations have fallen. But for the first time, we have a global civilization. And we haven't solved any of the problems that caused the other civilizations to fall. And the way a civilization will fall today, because of exponential technologies, will be not just a temporary devastation, but a extinction or near extinction level event. That's never been true in world history. We've never had bows and arrows and B-52 bombers don't have that capacity. And even a nuclear bomb in 1945 was in some sense controllable, right? Because it's very hard to develop enriched uranium. It takes nation capacities, national capacities. But now we have seven or eight other forms of existential risk that don't require state capacities, that are potential, what Nick Bostrom, who coined the term existential risk, calls black balls. Now, Underneath all these existential risks, there's a overriding underlying root cause. And the root cause, and it, it's dual, and this is going to take us into the movie. But let me just let me just set the stage again. Okay. Let's set the stage. Underlying all of the existential risks, whether it's from AI, artificial intelligence, and in particular forms right, of artificial intelligence, whether it's from the huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, right, whether it's from the extraction model, which causes the exponential growth curve, which ultimately has to fall off, right, whether it's from rogue drones generating weaponized payloads, whether it's from biological warfare through pandemics, right, of, of an entirely different order than what we're dealing with today, right? Whatever the particular, excuse me, whatever the particular form is of existential risk, which is actual risk to the planet, the death of humanity, and the second form of existential risk, which is not the death of humanity, but the death of our humanity, 
right? That we actually generate a technocracy, right? A worldwide grid where everyone is reduced to a number on the grid operating according to an algorithmic pattern with no courses of appeal. Humans are ultimately commodified reduced to their lowest common denominator, we get downgraded humans and upgraded algorithms. And that technocracy is where we're going and, and social media is one of the forms of generating that technocracy, right? And the, the models, the business models of the big five, right, in tech, which are based on their own form of extraction model, right, extracting what they call data exhaust or data mining putting all of that data exhaust about you, meaning how long you hover right above, right before you click with the mouse. What's your precise pattern of response to a series or a particular series of sequences that try and get you to respond to a particular ad? We chart the pattern of your response to particular sequences to know precisely how to manipulate you. What's the course of your month? When are you most vulnerable, right? Based on your data, Right. When are you getting your period? Right. Now you're going to be vulnerable then. We can check. Right. When might you gotten fired for a job? When? Right. And it's literally the amount of data put together on you is shocking, completely, utterly shocking. But then it's fed. It's not analyzed by an individual. It's fed into machine intelligence. Machine intelligence then produces a personality profile either on you specifically or on a, you as part of a what's called a peer group, but it's not really a peer group. It's people who respond to the same sequencing in their, what Daniel Kahneman calls fast thinking. So in other words, the web becomes a, a worldwide nervous system. It was actually called the nervous system of the planet by Alex Pentland at the MIT Media Lab, right? Who's part of this move towards this global technocracy in which free will doesn't exist for Alex Pentland as he's declared very clearly in the MIT Technological Review. And he's based ultimately on and deep roots in behaviorist psychology and, and B.F. Skinner. So that's the death of our humanity. So the existential risk, existential level, extinction level events, the death of humanity, existential risk, the death of our humanity, right? Poised between utopia and dystopia. And the difference between the two, right, is in the if only. And so what are we missing? And that's that we're going to talk about the movie today. So we're missing is two things. And this is the key. The core generator function of existential risk is not an infrastructure issue. It's not the technology, right? It's not social structure. It's not actually the structure of our governments, as important as they are. But the core issue is a superstructure. And superstructure means the story, the invisible framework, the inescapable framework, the story, the narrative in which we live. What's the story of value that informs everything? Right. So if our story of value is what we've called success 2.0, which is the modern success story, that's the story of modernity after it's rejected all the value stories of pre-modernity for lots of good reasons. Right. Because in pre-modernity, God and devil got really mixed up. Right, Brad. Right. Right. So so along comes modernity and says there's a there's an individual achiever. There's a separate self. Right. Who who competes. It's rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. So rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, that becomes the DNA code, quite literally, right, of the social structure. And that DNA code, rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, gets replayed billions and billions of times. It's literally in our mind, right? And it, it, you, it's hard to fight an enemy who has playgrounds in your mind, right? The Rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, success story governs everything we do. And it's it's between us and everyone, right? Are we successful is the question we're always asking. Not are we good, not are we true, not are we beautiful? Am I succeeding? Am I successful? Every company, all the divisions within a company, every religion, all the divisions within a religion, right? Every state, every province, every family, right? Every team, and right? all the people within, there's always... Rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics of separate self against separate self. That's That causes, that generates what we've called many times hyper-object complicated systems, right? Meaning 
such a complicated system of economics, of sexuality, right, of politics, so many pieces happening all around the globe. You can't trace the financial or social instruments. Everything's dissociated from everything else, complete alienation, and the system begins to break down. Supply, supply chains break down, currency chains break down, and, and they're, they're right at the brink of breakdown. Unless you track it, you can't see it. The parts are dissociated from each other. So both of these dimensions, this complicated systems, hyperobjects, and these win-lose metrics, rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, are rooted in a deeper global intimacy disorder. The global intimacy disorder is the source for existential risk, and itself it's rooted in the lack of a shared story of value. First principles and first values embedded in a story of value, right? right, which can actually generate a completely different world. The only thing that's ever changed the vector of history, and on this, I agree with my colleague Yuval Harari, with the very few things we agree on, is that only a new story of value, historically that's validated, changes the vector of history. Da Vinci, Renaissance, tells a new story, pre-modernity and its structures are breaking down. But the threat then was relatively little, even with the Black Death, even with half of Europe, virtually destroyed, there was no exponential technology. There was no global civilization with exponential technology. We're in an entirely different moment, meaning the past has passed its baton to the present. All the past needs us to fulfill its destiny. All of the sacrifices, all of the lives, all of the loves, all of the evolution of consciousness is now the baton's passed to us. We rep, we're the present and the future needs us. There is literally no future without us. The future doesn't exist without us. There is no future. There, everything will be stillborn. Unborn trillions of people depend on us. So all of the past, all of the present, all of the future is literally in our hands and we look down. So here we go. Let's take a look at this movie, but we're gonna look at the movie not as, as it's been explained by the half of the people that like it, right, as a great, call and cry for climate change. Climate change is a more complex issue. Look at the book I talked to you about, an important issue, but it's not the core, right? One. Two, right, we want to look at the movie as a text of culture and see what did it get right, what did it get wrong? We talked about it in broad terms last week in terms of existential risk. And I've, I've dedicated the last, you know, 10, 15 years to this, right? Day and night, many of you have who are with us. This is everything depends on us. And we're at the leading edge and one mountain, many paths, right? It's the hub of, of literally of revolution, right? How do we actually enact a revolution in value, right? Which, which actually changes, evolves the source code of culture and consciousness by enacting the overwhelming moral, social joy imperative of this moment to tell a new story, not a conjecture, not a made up story, but to actually integrate the leading edge strands of wisdom, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern, a validated insight, and to put them together in a synergistic whole greater than the sum of the parts, which actually tells a new story that we can tell each other and we can tell at any truck driver stop, at any finance firm, in any nursery, or at any place in the world. It's a shared story of value rooted in first principles and first values. Because without first principles and first values, we don't move. Okay, now we're going to talk about today about first principles and first values and what the challenge is and why, they don't, why they've been rejected. And we're going to do it through the prism of the movie. So here's what we're going to do. I want to ask everyone, if you can, right, to take a look at last week. Okay, so when you finish today, we're going to send everyone, I hope by the end of the day, last week's clip, because that was the, the great meta context. I don't want to review any of those issues this week, but it's super important. Actually, just gentle invitation, invest yourself right? Forget about the all the little things we're going to do today. Invest yourself. Watch last week. You need last week to get the context. It's critical. We're going to take that as a given. We're going to dive in. We're going to look at four sets of clips today, which are completely surprising, which have been completely ignored by culture. Either the pro-movie, anti-movie people all ignored. None of them commented on, but they're actually the key to the whole story. Welcome to all the new people. We welcome, you know, just madly good to be with you. Right. And every week people join from around the world. This is, I think, our 275th week. Right. We're here every week. We're, we're broadcasting and we're studying and we're participating together in actually evolving 
the source code. You know, in the old world that happened at the university, you know, I went and I, I sat in Oxford and wrote my doctorate there. It's not happening in Oxford, right? My partner, Zach, right, who's the co-president of our think tank, did it in Harvard, right? It's not happening in Harvard. There's a reason we didn't stay in Oxford and Harvard. Right? The university's not doing it. it. The university itself, right, is lost in its own win-lose metrics. Or Harvard is lost in its capital campaigns and in running its finances. And right? I went to Oxford, I couldn't find any real conversation. Right. The churches and the synagogues involved in their win-lose metrics and blessings to them. They're all doing things that, that are value. But actually, the real conversation, right? The, the place where we're actually waking up and we're saying, okay, let's change the source code of consciousness and culture, right? Is actually no longer in the old legacy institutions of power, which is why we came together to form the Center for Noble Wisdom and why Barbara Marks Hubbard created right, the Foundation for Conscious Evolution, which we partnered in, which is all part of our our office for the future, because right, we have to actually enact today a memory of the future. We have to recover a memory of the future. Hope is a memory of the future. So with that in mind, let's go into this text of culture and let's find our way. We're going to end today right, with prayer. Now, prayer is also a theme in the movie. It appears five times and don't look up. We're going to talk about that next week. But when we talk about prayer and God, we're not talking about the God you don't believe in. The God you don't believe in doesn't exist. We're talking about not the prayer, which is a cosmic vending machine that you give, put in a quarter and get, right? Some reward from the God you don't believe in. No, that, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about a new age medievalism replayed. We're talking about divinity as the incessant, ceaseless creativity of cosmos that knows your name, that operates and lives through first person, lives in you, as you, and through you. Third person, the four forces animated by Eros. And second person, the infinity of intimacy, the space between us, right? The reality of personhood, the personhood of cosmos. And God as the infinite personhood, not the person, not the grandfather or grandmother, but the infinite personhood that knows our name in which our personhood directly participates. So let's dive in. I wanna look at a bunch of sets of clips, okay? And what we're gonna do is each set of clips, we're gonna look at a, a set of a few clips strung together, and then we're gonna use those clips to actually launch board into culture and to understand where we are and where we need to go. Now, to be clear, when we do this textual reading of culture, which is going to be wildly exciting, we're not claiming that the makers of the movie had this or didn't have it in mind. It's often the case that the makers of a movie, right, are unconscious. They've got kind of a general sense, oh, wow, Adam McKay, I'm doing this movie about climate change, and that's great. But once something's been created, it, it's created from something deeper than the conscious mind of the creator. It emerges right from the field of culture itself. I remember sitting in Chicago with my friend then Lana Wachowski, who actually just made a new movie, The Matrix of Resurrection. But at that time, V for Vendetta was a movie that he had made, had come out, and we sat, you know, almost all night right at his place in Chicago. And I was explaining to Lana, who had made the movie, what his movie was about. Now, how can you do that? Right? Because we both understood. That whatever Lana thought he was doing, the question is, what does the text say? And the text is always powerful. Texts of culture are powerful and they're critical and crucial. So let's read texts of culture. We're going to start with Kate. Okay. So in the movie, I'm going to try and kind of just kind of lay out the frame a little bit. Okay. For those of you who, 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 who are not tracking super closely, right? You know the general theme Comet about to hit Earth, Kate. And Randall, Randall Mindy is his name, Kate DiBiaschi, I believe, a student and a professor. They detect the comet. They understand. They do the calculations of the trajectory. It's going to hit Earth. We all know that's happening, right? They then go to try and right, alert reality. They team up with Teddy, right, who's this wonderful man, right? Ole Grove, right? I think I just pronounced his name wrong. I apologize for that. What is Teddy's last name? And whatever it is, I'm Oglethorpe, right? They team up with Teddy Oglethorpe, right? they get stymied and stopped, right? They're ignored, right? They can't get their message across, right? They get commodified, they get co-opted, right? The whole movie, we talked about that all last week. 
All right, but we're now going to look at this week, we're going to look at individual clips and see kind of what actually happens. So we're going to look at a surprising set of clips. When Kate and Randall, Professor Randall Mindy, now we're going to slow down, Professor Randall Mindy, with his graduate student, Kate, doctoral student, they come to the White House. They're going to inform the president, played by Meryl Street. Her name is Janie Orlean. Her son, Jason Orlean, is her chief of staff. They're about to meet the president to inform the president of this comet, or at the very beginning of the movie. They're waiting because there's some crisis going on in the White House. And a general, his name is Stuart Themes, he's a three star general, gets them some snacks. And something strange happens with these snacks that are not commented on in culture at all, but they're actually utterly essential to the movie. And actually, there's a theme that moves through the movie several times after the snack story that we're about to see. Kate comments on this snack story. Right after Kate's unable to get anyone to respond, right? She 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 abandons ship, right? And she goes through a very particular and gorgeous set of unfoldings. She keeps telling the snack story again and again. So take us inside. Let's see three or four clips that we're going to string together about this unspoken hidden theme in the movie, which is actually the one of the keys to the entire story, conscious or unconscious in the mind of the movie makers doesn't, doesn't matter. Let's go inside, let's read this text of culture, let's love this open, let's begin to find our way to responding to existential risk. Here we go, take us inside. We're ready, Tahele? Let's do this. Yeah, they charge an arm and leg for this stuff. With a ten a piece ought to do it. Where do I pay for these? It's free. Really? Yes, it's the White House. The general. He charged us for the snacks, but they're free. Oh, gosh. Why on earth would he do that? A... Why would he charge us for free snacks? I mean, maybe he just gets off on the power. You know, like any kind of power. It's like he knew eventually that I was going to find out that the snacks were free. Right. Watch out for him. He'll charge you for free shit. Did everyone get that? Four scenes. Okay, who tracked that? Four scenes. None of them are noticed in culture at all. Free snacks. And it's not a casual scene in the beginning. It's repeated four times throughout the movie. What's it about? Who cares? Right? Well, snacks are free. Why is a three-star general charging, right, for snacks when the snacks are free, number one? And look at the beginning. It's the beginning scene. It's the inception of the movie. And he makes them get changed 20 bucks. So I'll, you know, I'll give you the 20 bucks. I'll pay for you. And then three times she keeps returning to the scene and she can't figure it out. Right. And when she's with Yule, that was Yule. That was scene three. Y-U-L-E, Yule. He was also the dude who played in Dune, right, as Paul Atreides, if you remember him. So she's with Yule and they're both looking up. And they're talking about what's going on here. So what's this about? And let's stay really close, friends. Reality is made of billions of micro actions. And if you look at the designers of the web, like Alex Pentland, who we mentioned earlier from the MIT Media Lab, who talks about in wake of B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist psychologist, he talks about the billions of micro acts that people do every day that they do in reaction that are a function of what we call fast thinking. Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize laureate, he calls it fast thinking. It's automatic. It's unconscious. It's habitual, as opposed to kind of deep reflective thinking, which we do very little. So what Pentland understands is, is that you actually create the fabric of reality through billions and billions of micro acts that happen virtually automatically, which Pentland believes correctly through nudges, through social pressure, right? Through everything that's happening today in the complex of the web, you can actually control the way people are gonna vote. 
You can control what they're going to buy. You can actually control mood right? in multiple ways. And, and that's the subject of a different conversation, which we've had several times. Now, stay close. Shoshana Zuboff wrote a book on this called Surveillance Capitalism. There's another book written a couple of years earlier by Brett Fleischman from Cambridge University called Re-Engineering Humanity. Jaron Lanier has written three or four books on this from You Are Not a Gadget in 2007 to 10 Reasons Why to Get Off of Social Media in 2018. Right? There's an entire literature on this, which is, which is quite good. Now, stay close. Let's stay really, really close. And we're going to get back to Zuboff and surveillance capitalism in a second. Let's just take one piece from this now, which is that there are billions of micro acts that make up the social fabric. Now, what determines our micro acts? All of our unconscious, habitual, and automatic actions, which form the fabric of society, what informs them? What informs them is always the story we're living in. We're embedded in a hidden story. We're actors in that story. Charles Taylor, a fantastic book called Sources of Self. The human being lives in inescapable frameworks. And that framework is my story, right? In advanced terms, we use mathematics, but in our everyday lives, we use stories. We're informed by story. We're entranced by story. We live as characters in a story right? That's unbelievably important. Now, when my story is not rooted in first principles and first values, all that's left is power. That was the essence of Foucault's, Michel Foucault's critique, his postmodern critique of reality. All that's left is power. So what Foucault says is there's no value, which he got wrong. What he got right is when there's no value, all that's left is power. So what happens? It's, it's an incredible scene. There's a three-star general. Person becomes a three-star general it's because they're interested in power. They, they also may be interested in serving their country, which is beautiful, but they're also interested in power. And there's a set of micro acts. You're now giving snacks to these couple of visitors who've come to the White House and you act this micro act, you automatically make a power move. You don't make a value move. The value move is someone comes into your home, someone comes into your space, you feed them, you nourish them. The notion of nourishing the guest is a first value and first principle. I nourish the guest who's in my space, right? We, we take care of each other. We create resource for each other. We feed each other. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East and a good friend of mine, Khaled, a Bedouin, when I would walk into Khaled's tent, the second I would walk into his tent, I was a king and feeding me and nourishing me. And had I offered Khaled to pay for anything that he gave me, he would have shot me. I mean, figuratively, right? Because it was a violation of this first principle and first value that lived between us that we nourish each other. So now is everyone tracking? You come to the Pentagon, it's amazing, right? You come to the Pentagon, right, right, right? You come to the White House. The Pentagon with its three-star general is in the White House, right? General Stuart themes. And he, there's no first principle and first value of nourishment. There's no first principle and first value of, of honesty. There is no sense of radical honesty. Right? And once there's no radical honesty, once there's no first principle and first value, then it's an entire story repeated billions of times, micro repetitions, right? Micro billions of repetitions of the violation of first principles and first values. And the only thing that's left in the space that's in the third clip is power. This is a power. It was a power movement and it was a sadistic power movement. I want you to catch this. It was a sadistic power movement because as Jennifer Lawrence says, Kate in the movie, he knew we were going to find out. He knew we were going to find out right after he left that it was free, and he knew we couldn't do anything about it. So once you remove first principles and first values, then you create, you create a structure of society where the billions of micro acts that take place take place sans first values and first principles. So you introduce a kind of insidious undermining 
the, the basic first principle, first value of the guest in my home doesn't exist. There's a violation of trust. There's a violation, right, of, and there's no love without trust. Love's always, Eris always built on trust. There's no trust. And she keeps repeating the scene because she's stunned. How could that be? And she's coming to this realization that, oh my God, I thought, I thought we could make it without explicating first values and first principles. I thought we could make it just on a kind of general, feel good, poetic, artistic, aesthetic. And I love art and I like poetry and I love aesthetics. But actually what we're trying to do is even after postmodernity has deconstructed all value, we think we're gonna be okay. We think it's okay to actually have a success story, rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics and we'll find our way through. We won't because the entire social fabric now governed by what Alex Petlin calls the nervous system of the planet becomes non-intimate, right? The intimate universe is undermined, right? When the eros is, is completely destroyed because trust is destroyed, because the nurturing is destroyed, because the guest right, isn't honored because the basic honesty between human beings and the basic sense of care, right, is exploded. And it comes up four times in the movie again and again and again. And the best that the movie can get to, and it, it does its best, the best the movie can get to is, is, right, she says power. It, it, it must have been a power trip, which is Foucault. That's the postmodern explanation. But what the movie doesn't get to is, is the breakdown of first values and first principles. Does everyone get that? The movie itself refuses to declare first values and first principles. And that's very much, now stay close friends, it's very much like Shoshana Zuboff's work in Surveillance Capitalism, which is a book which analyzes the business model of the techplex. And we're now concluding a book at the think tank, which we're calling Techno Feudalism which is dealing with a set of the same issues. And we're critiquing the tech flex, but we're also critiquing Shoshana Zuboff with, with lots of respect and love, which is that Shoshana herself and all the other critics of the tech flex themselves, when they talk about the business model, right? The tech flex is absorbing your data, pouring it into machine intelligence, creating a personality profile, selling it to misaligned third parties in order to create predictive analysis of what you might do. And we're selling that predictive analysis ostensibly, right? To be able to control the world. That's one of the reasons the techplex is lined up with the security establishments. There's an enormous amount of data on that to try and create some sense of control in a world run wild and for exponential profit and power. So Zuboff names the business model, but she refuses to tell us what first principles and first values is this violating. And every time in surveillance capitalism, she begins to come close to a first principle and a first value. What she does is now stay really close to me. We're doing a very deep dive here. What she does is, so for example, taking your data should be a violation of personhood. It's a violation of the intrinsic dignity of human personhood, which is a first value and first principle of cosmos. But Zuboff refuses to declare it as so. And instead what she does is she cites Sartre, the existentialist from his book, Being and Nothingness, as the source of the value of personhood. But of course, what she's doing is she's avoiding the issue. She's actually making an intellectual dishonest feint thing that no one will catch it, when in fact it undermines the very fabric of society because Sartre is the apostle of cosmic meaninglessness. Sartre believes there are no first principles and first values. That's his whole point. Being in Nothingness is one of my favorite books. Read page 550, 549 to 555. You'll see one of the cores right, of this argument in Being in Nothingness. For Sartre, there are no first values and first principles. For Sartre, there is no story of value. So. What Zuboff is trying to do, which is the same thing that Don't Look Up is trying to do is, it's trying to say, okay, we, we're not gonna name first principles and first values. Now, now why? Not because Zuboff's a bad person, she's a great person. Not because Adam McKay and the gang making, right, this, this movie, Don't Look Up are bad dudes, bad people, they're fantastic human beings. 
No, they actually identify first values and first principles with medievalism. They think that value is a pre-modern quality. And they've been completely taken by the academic critique of value, which says that all value is relative, right? All value is always changing. So therefore we can never talk about first values and first principles. Now the academic critique is partially right. There's critiques of natural law, right? Which claims first values and first principles that shows that natural law is actually making religious claims and claiming to be doing first values and first principles. And natural law doesn't take into account, for example, the fact that love, which is a value, changes all the time. So the, the academic critique of natural law, or first values and first principles says, you can't declare first values and first principles because even if you say love is a value, love was something a thousand years ago and something else 2000 years ago. So clearly it's complete culturally contextual, it's completely socially constructed. That's not exactly right. It's a critical mistake. Of course, love evolves. Of course, love evolves. And of course, you can't say that this form of love is the first value and first principle. That's true. But love itself is not a social construction. Love in the general sense that I care, right? that I nurture, that I'm concerned with, that's a first principle and a first value. Now stay really close, friends. It's an evolving first principle and first value. Did you get that? In other words, first principles and first values are not only eternal, they're not only rooted in the very structure of cosmos, but by eternal, we don't mean unchanging. Eternity doesn't mean everlasting time. That's just a lot of time. By eternity, we mean it's beneath time. It's beneath the space-time continuum. Intrinsic in the fabric of cosmos is meaning. Meaning lives in cosmos. And meaning evolves, right? The nature of reality is, is that meaning evolves. Love evolves. The story of reality is the evolution of love. Evolution is not just the move from simplicity to complexity. Evolution is the progressive deepening of intimacies, the evolution of love. So love moves, gets deeper and deeper, gets wider and wider, right? Love used to mean I love the people in my tribe, right? So everybody agreed you can't kill a human being right, in the pre-modern period, but everyone said human beings are only the people in my tribe. That's tragic. So there was love, but love was for my community. So that was a boundary mistake, was a critical boundary mistake. We need to shift the boundary. No one's outside. No one's outside the circle. The evolution of love means we expand the circle. We expand our circle of intimacy and love. We expand our circle of care and concern, right? And we love more and more until no one's outside the circle. But love itself, love is the first principle and first value. And unless I declare love to be a first principle and a first value, unless intimacy is a first principle and a first value, unless the irreducible uniqueness of human personhood is a first principle and a first value, unless trust is a first principle and first value, unless integrity is a first principle and first value, right? Unless there's first principles and first values embedded in a story of value. And the story of value is I'm a unique self. And I have unique gifts to give, and I have a unique story to tell, and I have a unique poem to write, a unique song to sing. And together, right, I can care for larger than my egocentric circle. We can come together as unique selves and join the unique self symphony and address the unique needs in our unique circle of intimacy and influence. That's what it means to be alive, to give my gifts, to give my gifts for the sake of my own full being and for the becoming of the whole planet. Right, that's a great story. I'm I'm a unique self. I'm a hero in this story. I have superpowers that no one else that ever was, is, or will be can have. And living my life and giving my unique gift, which has irreducible value, that's needed by all that is. Wow, right. And my person, it's irreducible, and it's not it's not commodifiable. And you don't have a right to steal my data and feed it into machine intelligence. Never begin to get it. But unless you have first values and first principles, you can't even begin the conversation. And, and paradoxically, just like Shoshana Zuboff, who gets the violation of the techplex, but refuses to name first values and first principles through no fault of her own, because she didn't have right, an understanding of first values and first principles that, that worked. She was right about that. So what we're, we're doing now at the center is we're now articulating a new vision of value. Value is evolving value. There are evolving first values and first principles. Human personhood intimacy, love, trust, integrity. Those are not social constructions of reality. Those are not contrived meaning. 
Th those are part of the meaning structures of cosmos and cosmos is its design structure. It's inherent in the, 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 the conflict between Darwin and design is nonsense. Near Darwinism is dead as is intelligent design. There's a third, there's a much deeper third. Reality has an inherent design. There's an inherent telos to reality. Reality is moving from mud to Mozart. It's moving from bacteria to Bach. It's moving from quarks to culture. There's a story, and that story is the evolution of love, in which there's more and more creativity, and there's more and more care, and there's more and more uniqueness, and there's more and more interconnectivity, and there's more and more intimacy. Those are the plot lines of cosmos. And my story and the plot line of my story participates in those plot lines of cosmos. And here's the thing. Stay close, friends. We've just begun. All of that is missing. And don't look up. Don't look up. They sense it. But they can't quite say it because they don't have a language. They don't have a new story of value. It's our job right here, right in, in one mountain is to articulate this new story of value. They're looking for it. And we're, we're going to get deeper and deeper. We're going to do a couple of more rounds here. We're going to get deeper and deeper. It's, it's shocking and it's beautiful. So there's this story, this thread, this invisible thread that we've seen the movie about this three-star general charging for snacks and he's lying because that symbolizes, it captures, and it's an intuitive realization by the makers of the movie, which they don't quite know how to explicate. It's not quite formulated even in their own minds and hearts, but they're reaching for something and they're reaching for something good and true and beautiful, which is Reality is made up of billions of micro acts. This is a little, small, minor, irrelevant act, but it's everything because it's exponentialized across the system when the system is sans first values and first principles. Wow. Did everyone begin to get that? I, I, want, I want to add another piece. Let's go deeper, okay? Let's go a little deeper, okay? Let's go a little deeper. There's one more step, and then we're going to we're at the very beginning and we're not going to go too long, but I want to just, this is just the beginning and it's just, it's, it's gorgeous. There's a scene later in the movie, which we're going to, we're going to see later, probably, probably next week, but there's a scene in which Peter Isherwell, and if you're in the chat box, let me know if you remember the scene, Peter Isherwell, who is the head of Bash. And he's the guy who always says, it's fine. It's fine. It will all be fine. Remember him? Who remembers him in the chat box? Who remembers him? Okay. I'm going to take a look in the chat box for a second now. Right. Who remembers the guy? Everyone remember him? OK, so there's a scene in which Peter Isherwell, right, is presenting to the cabinet. And this is after there's been a mission to deflect the comet. The comet can be deflected. And then Peter Isherwell, the head of Bash, right, says to Janie, hey, we got to call back the nukes because I just realized there's all this value right in these outer space, you know, in this in this comet. There's all these rare minerals that are now controlled by China, which is actually the situation today. And what we're going to do is we're going to not take it down with this nuclear strike. We're going to actually we have another way of doing it. And he, he has a Nobel Prize winner get up in front of the cabinet and explain how they're going to be able to take the comet down. You would think Nobel Prize winner, we should trust her, right? No, we shouldn't trust her. That's the point. Right. The point is that actually the process of peer review didn't take place in the science. And actually, the structure of a business, which is supposed to be in dialectical balance with the structure of science, is actually completely disproportionately undermined the checks and balances of society. So actually, the same way that the general sells for 20 bucks snacks, the noble Lorette right, actually sold herself to Bash and actually risked the planet because she was in her win-lose metrics, she was working for Bash. She was a Nobel Prize winner and she's sitting there working for Bash, right, to actually increase, right, their profits. Today in the world, just as an example, there's about 10,000 great data scientists in the world today. Data science is utterly critical Right, in order to avoid existential risk, virtually all 10,000 of those data scientists work for Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon right, and Microsoft. Those are the big five. So there's been a complete drain of the best skills from Nobel Prize winners right, all the way down. Right? The universities can't even get people to fill the positions because everyone's working for these big five. 
So, so once there's no first values and first principles, there's nothing to actually cause even a person who's a Nobel laureate to actually pursue knowledge. Right? The great movement of science was based on first values and first principles, the value of truth, the value of facts, the value of the pursuit of knowledge. Once we deconstruct value, we deconstruct the pursuit of knowledge. We deconstruct facts. We deconstruct the nobility of science. And science becomes hijacked and the information ecology breaks down. So we're precisely at a moment when the information ecology is broken down. And, and look at the huge conflict over vaccines in which there's two very clear sides that actually don't speak to each other when there's validated information on both sides. But actually, it's not being driven by fact. It's being driven by other meta narratives, right, which actually collapse the system. Right? So it's a very critical idea. The second you actually have a win-lose metrics, rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, the second rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics drives the three-star general who's going to sell snacks. It also drives the Nobel laureate to work for Bash instead of being involved in the first principle and first value of the, the noble pursuit of truth, the noble pursuit of facts. And it's shocking. Okay. So now let's, let's go another step. Okay. We're going to go just one more step here just to kind of to kind of get this. So how are we doing, everybody? Is everyone tracking? We doing okay? Okay, let's go to the next step. Let's go to the next step. And it's beautiful, but it's it's beautiful in a shocking way. And it's, it's, it's beyond important. So there's a gentleman named Brian Cox. I want to just, I want to just give you, I want to validate the claim that I just made. I just made a claim that this movie refuses to name first principles and first values although it intuits their breakdown and it artistically, aesthetically documents that intuitive breakdown in these four scenes of the snack ripoff, right? The breakdown of trust and, and Jennifer Lawrence's shock at that breakdown of trust. Now, stay close. We're gonna go just two short steps, but it's critical. The movie itself is shocked that no one's looking up. And by no, no one looking up, the movie's making obviously an obvious and correct point, right? It, which has consumed my last decade, which is, oh my God, existential risk is real. Why are we not responding? Because that's important. We have to save the future, but, but stay close. And here's the deal. And this is the deal. And this is this where it gets kind of crazy. See, here's the thing. Saving the future itself is a first principle and first value, right? In other words, we only move to save ourselves when we're immediately confronted by the tiger. When we're not immediately confronted by the tiger or by cancer, we actually go about our business and we displace death, right? We're gonna talk about this in three stages now, we displace death. Now, as long as the human being has the capacity to displace existential risk beyond the thread of their own lifetime, even if it will enter into their children's lifetime. As long as the human being can displace the thread of existential risk, right, beyond their lifetime, they will look away. Because, right, the very, right, the very notion that we're gonna save the future, the responsibility to future generations, is itself a first principle and first value. Now stay close. We understand, right, if someone's dying in front of us, that we have to take care of them. We, we kind of, we get that. Someone's dying in front of us, we, we we pretty much get there's some there's some responsibility to save them. That's still, you know, generally in place, although not absolutely. But what happens if someone's dying on the other side of the world? So let's say we displace the ethical challenge geographically. There's a geographical spatial dislocation of the ethical challenge. It's happening in Biafra. Let's say, stay close with me, my friends. Let's say that my name is Bill Clinton. And let's say you were living in America while Bill Clinton was president or any place else in the world or in France or in Great Britain, right? Or in Holland. And everybody in the entire world knew that 800,000 Hutus we're macheting and massacring men, women, and children, Tutsis, in Rwanda, and no one in the world did anything. For 100 days, 
although everyone knew it was happening. Why? Because, because they looked away, because they couldn't actually be intimate. And intimacy means feel me feeling you. Intimacy means I shatter the boundary of my skin encapsulated ego, and I realize I'm not merely a separate self, and we're part of the same field, although we're unique expressions of the field. But actually, to, to actually experience that intimacy, right, to actually transcend the optical delusion of separate consciousness, to transcend the optical delusion of separateness, right, the effort to do that, that's a value. That's the value of transformation. That's the value of intimacy. But if that's not a first value and first principle, which, which there's an ultimate violation if I ignore it, I'm not going to do it, Right. The Black Lives Matter movement in America explodes because everyone sees in front of them the violation of a first principle and first value, right? You see, you see a man, right, with with with, with a, a a a knee on his neck for you know nine minutes, right? Who dies? It's a kind of snuff film, right? Seen, right? You know, tens and tens of millions of times, and you realize, oh my God, that's an that's a violation of first values and first principles. And even though we were in the middle of the beginning of COVID then, and everyone was, right, right, was not sure how exactly contagion worked and the fear was correctly real, everyone flooded the streets because we flooded the streets because our will is activated by the violation of a first principle and first value. But if there's no first principle and first value, then there's nothing that calls me to be intimate with Rwanda. And there's nothing that calls me to step out of Right. Pink Floyd comfortably numb. Right. The the business of usual as my life. So no one responded to Rwanda friends because there was a dislocation in space. Now, what if friends. Right. We move from a dislocation in space to a dislocation in time because we're all afflicted by temporal myopia. Temporal means time. Myopia means a narrowing of vision, meaning if we can't feel what's happening right now because it's in a different part of the world. What expectation is that we're going to feel what's happening in a different time where the dislocation is not spatial, but temporal, not space, but time? That's actually, it's not human nature. No, no, no. It's human nature sans first principles and first values. Human beings are, stay close, human beings are not naturally good. Human beings are inherently good, but goodness needs to be trained. And we only train goodness if there's a value in that training. If goodness is a value, we train it. I was talking to a woman named Betsy Farnham, who passed away not that long ago, a wonderful woman, right, who taught at one of the leading at Exeter Academy, one of the leading academies in the country, a fantastic human being. And she said to me, when I came to teach in Exeter, everybody knew what the good, the true, and the beautiful was. And Exeter is the institution that produced Mark Zuckerberg, not by accident. When I came to teach at Exeter, she said, everyone knew the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's what we wanted to facilitate from the students. By the time I left Exeter, she said, when she retired a few years ago, and she recently passed, she said, no one, the students nor the faculty, no one knew what the good, the true, and the beautiful were. And its value itself collapsed. And the collapse of value is at the core of existential risk, right? And so we need to actually reclaim first values and first principles, but evolving first values and first principles embedded in a story of value. And a new story of value, that's the overwhelming moral imperative of the time. And if we make a movie, don't look up, it's fantastic. But if we're, we're not willing, just like Shoshana Zuboff was unwilling in surveillance capitalism, to declare first values and first principles, and instead we rely on this implied kind of theatrical ruse, we're going to have these four clips, right, about the violation of integrity, right, charging 20 bucks for snacks, which no one tracks. And probably the writers themselves didn't quite track. It's incohate because there's no story of value. So that's a very, very, very big deal. Okay. So let's hold this together. So if that's the case, then we can't expect people to look up because looking up itself, right? When the comet's not right in front of you, they only look up in the movie when the comet's right in front of them. There's no, there's no more dislocation in time. But when there is a dislocation in time and you can't see the comet, Right. You can't see the 10 forms of existential risk because you're going about business as usual and you're myopically narcissistically involved in the trauma of your life, whatever it might be. And in the, the victim dramas of your life or in the rivalrous conflict, win, lose metric success 2.0 story, there's no possible way you're going to you're going to look up because you're looking up beyond the time horizon of your life.
right? And unless there's a first principle and first value that says we're committed to the continuity of consciousness, we're committed to the continuity of generations. And it's possible to do that. Okay, it's it's completely possible to do. I want to just tell you a, a story for a second. I was in Dharamsala, um, you know, a bunch of years back. Okay, I was in Dharamsala a bunch of years back, and I was talking to the Dalai Lama. So I was a, in his home in in um, Dharamsala after we had spent some time together at the Pope's sub, summer residence in Castel Gandolfo, where kind of a group of people got together a bunch of years back to talk about the future of the world as if anyone cared what we had to say, right? So, and the Dalai Lama and I had a little bit of an argument there. It's a story I've told before. I won't tell it to you now, but you know, in a short, we had a little bit of an argument, right? And I thought he was saying things that were kind of fundamentally off. And so we had a, a clash, but, but we, we liked each other in the clash because we, we got out of the politeness of it all, okay? We got out of the politeness of it all. So, so let's stay close. Let's stay close. Let's stay close. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's really, really beautiful. Let's stay really, really close. Okay, so so what happens was, right? What happened was, and let's stay really close and really because it's really and it's crazy important, right? So what happened was, right? He invites me to Dharamsala, right? And you know, in Dharamsala, you know, he says, you know, how do how do we get people to concern with the future? And so I said to him, right? You know, and he was particularly he says, how do I get Tibetans, right, concerned with the future of Tibetan Buddhism? And I said to him, and I remember it very carefully, I said it very clearly, and it was very poignant. I said, there has to be a value of the future, right? The desire for the future is a value. And unless we declare a value of the future, we can't get there. We just can't get there. There's no possible way to get there. Does everyone get that? You can't get there. And I want to just give you an, an example of one people right? Which is, which is a very, very beautiful example. And this is, you know, a, a you know, and I'll, I'll take the example, you know, of the, and it's, it's an interesting example of the Jewish people. And, you know, the Jewish people, like, like the Christian people, like the Muslim people, you know, have their strengths and weaknesses, right? Every, we all do. And, and I was, I was raised in, in the Jewish world. So I know, I know a little bit about it. And it's a, a, a beautiful and complex world. And there's one thing they got right. When they got right is commitment to continuity. And it's when you grow up in that community, there's a first principle and a first value, right? To have a continuity of community. That's a big deal, right? There's a first principle and first value. I'm concerned with the future generations. And so therefore, even though, and stay close, it's very, very wild. Even though all the historians said that when you lose your land and you lose your common language, right? And you lose your political power, and you go into exile, and it's a worldwide exile, and you're hated, right, as the Jews were, right, all through the ages, right, where the, 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 the scapegoat of humanity, you disappear as a people. There's no way you can survive as a people. And scholar after scholar, right, of history has said that if you lose your land, you lose your language, you lose your culture, you're dispersed around the world, you have no power, there's no possibility you'll survive. It's impossible. And yet, as Mark Twain point out, pointed out, he said, all things pass, and yet somehow something remains. These people are still here. Why are they still here? Right? They're still here because they established a first principle and first value of commitment to the future. Right? Now, this is not an argument for Judaism or Christianity or Islam right, or secular humanism, obviously. The point is, we have to establish first principles and first values. And the commitment to the future itself is a first principle and first value. Does everyone get that? In other words, if you sell snacks and you lie about it, and you're a Nobel laureate, right, who gives into the win-lose metrics, those are violations of first principles and first values, right? But the commitment to the future itself is a first principle and first value. And unless we understand and we create a first principle and first value that we are part of a shared humanity, but not as a conjecture, that that's actually, that's actually the metaphysical fact of reality. There's an optical delusion of separateness. And unless we actually begin to go much, much deeper into our identity, and we actually understand our identity to exist beyond our death, unless we have a broader vision of a world beyond our death, which is where we're going to begin next week, 
what happens after death. The movie talks, there's four or five scenes in the movie where they say, we're all going to die. Well, if in fact it ends at death, and it's very hard to enact a first principle and first value, which is responsible for the future, right? Because this is a short end story where in the end, everyone dies. So if everyone dies a little sooner, the collective death of humanity, not that much different than the death, death of an individual human unless we can actually understand that there's value beyond the collective death of humanity, right? That beyond the collective death of humanity, there's meaning, right? Beyond our individual death, there's meaning. There's continuity of consciousness. There's a meaning that lives underneath and beyond death. We're never gonna be responsible for a world beyond death. It's a very, very deep idea. And, and, and I'm gonna check in the chat box, see if just, it kind of, it's subtle, it's deep, it's beautiful, it's not, but it, it's not obvious, but it's everything, right? It's completely everything, right? If it all ends at death, that means it's a materialist game in which meaning is just created. That's not the case. And I want to just get this really clearly. I mentioned Brian Cox before. So Brian Cox, representing the BBC, talks about this movie. And the way he understands this movie, I'm going to read it to you. He says, essentially what he says, what this movie is saying is, right? It's 400 billion stars, he says, from trillions of planets, right? And it could be we're the only civilization that exists at all, right? And we have intelligence, we create meaning. So the only place that meaning exists in the world, he writes, right, is therefore very possibly on our planet. And so therefore, if meaning is destroyed on our planet, here's the quote, it's the destruction of meaning in the galaxy, and then he says again at the end of the BBC clip, and he says, you've got to realize, right, that this is the only place in the galaxy where anything matters. So that's Brian Cox, BBC on the movie, right? This is the only meaning in the galaxy. So therefore, if, if, if existential risk is fulfilled, there's no more meaning in the galaxy. Or this is the only place in the galaxy where anything matters. So what's Brian Cox saying? That's the non-first principles, first values reading of the story. And, and the movie allows itself to be read that way. It doesn't stand for first principles and first values. Does everyone get that? It's subtle, but it's beautiful and it's wildly important. It's not true. Meaning is intrinsic to cosmos, right? Allurement, autonomy, first principles and first values, just like they exist in mathematical equations, the exterior sciences exist in the interior sciences, right? Love is a real value of cosmos. Intimacy is a real value of cosmos. They evolve. Right? They get deeper, right? From matter to life to mind, value gets deeper, it gets more subtle, it gets more full, right? We evolve, right? That's a huge deal. The evolution of value is clear, but value is real in the cosmos, right? And it's only when I get that value is real. Yes, it's evolving value. And once I get that value is real, then my entire life, the joy, the, the ecstasy, the urgency, the pleasure, the eros of my life, is incarnating, right, an evolving value, right? When atoms come together, atoms are allured to each other. Stay close, friends. Atoms are allured to each other. They're separate atoms. They're allured to each other, subatomic particles, and they create a new whole greater than the sum of the parts. That's value. That's value. When Alfred North Whitehead, the great mathematician who wrote Principa, Math Principa Mathematica, volume two, with, with, with Bertrand Russell at Cambridge, what Whitehead talks about is the interior consciousness that goes all the way down the evolutionary chain, right? There's meaning. Meaning means there's patterns of value with deep intention of, of unbelievably complex structure at the subatomic level. This is not a mechanistic world. That's a scientific, that's a lie. Science doesn't say that. Scientism, dogmas of science say it. If you actually study science, you actually get that meaning, structures of meaning exist all the way down the evolutionary chain. Atoms are coming together, right? There's a, a dimension of freedom right, that exists in atoms themselves, as Stuart Kaufman's already pointed out. So the, the movement towards intimacy, right, towards greater holes from separate parts, right? The movement of allurement, right? The movement to create patterns of communication. Cells, individual cells, when they're under crisis, literally rewrite intelligently their DNA codes. Right? That's called natural genetic, genetic engineering. James Shapiro, University of Chicago, one of the best geneticists of this generation. Barbara McClintlack, Nobel Prize, 1972-73 for transposition, horizontal gene transfer. 
right? In other words, reality is intelligent all the way up and all the way down. It's a meaning structures all the way up and all the way down. The world's invested with intelligence. It's invested with meaning. It discloses meaning. It evolves meaning. And we're in devotion to meaning. We're in devotion to value. We're incarnations of that value, right? We are value come alive. We're evolution come alive. So that's where we got to go. We got to go to this place of creating a new vision of value.